Great, well, thank you all for being here today uh, for this special talk um, on Gabo Martinez's show, The Land of Flowers. We're very excited to have you all here today. We're very excited to have Gabo here today. Uh, my name is Maria Lisa Hegg. I am the curator of the exhibition, and it was my pleasure and privilege to work with Gabo on bringing this amazing show of new work to the Craft Center. Um, and I'm really excited for y'all to learn a bit more about the concept and content, the process, um, straight from Gabo's mouth. But before we get into our conversation, and, and during which we will be moving around the space, so feel free to get comfortable and move around as we explore different bodies of work in different areas. Um, but I just, just want to start by reading out Gabo's bio. So you'll have a little bit of knowledge about her CV, her accomplishments, of which there are many. Um, so based in San Marcos, Texas, Gabo Martinez is an inter interdisciplinary artist who was born in Guanajuato, Mexico. Drawing on traditional and contemporary motifs, Gabo utilizes these visual language, languages to craft a narrative of her own that reclaims and honors her own heritage. The mediums of printmaking and ceramics are combined to create installations and spaces that evoke the warmth of brown bodies and rich, vibrant colors. These spaces become vehicles for the reemergence of barro rojo, or red clay, into the present contemporary moment and elevates ancestral ceramic technologies and motifs. Barro Rojo lends itself in its softness and malleability to be molded into objects that can further immortalize our culture and our narratives. Barro Rojo is a historical and contemporary legacy. Gaba holds a BFA in Studio Arts with a concentration in ceramics from Texas State University at San Marcos, Texas. She is a founder of the Tepeyac Collective, a collective that aims to organize and highlight the BIPOC clay artists in Central Texas as a response to the lack of diversity and harmful gatekeeping within the present-day clay community. Gabo has completed residencies at the Sonoma Community Center in California, as well as a visiting artist residency at Texas A&M University in Laredo, Texas. She has been featured in Ceramics Monthly, as well as the Glass Tire 4x4 series. Her works are available in person at All the Fields Shop in Houston, not far from here, as well as The Wrong Store in Marfa. Welcome, Gabo. We're very happy to have you. So I think to kick things off, I just wanted to kind of pass the baton to you to let the folks know kind of what your idea was, what inspired you, and what your initial concepts were for the show when we entered into the conversation together about making it happen. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate y'all coming. Um, I think for this show, I've always wanted to move intentionally with my work, and I've always wanted to have a show where the color was yellow. So I started talking with Maria, and they were down. So I got really excited to create this installation. Um, I see color uh, as very emotive. Um, so definitely my work and the color, the intention is for it to be charged with energy. And I want to create these spaces that are reminiscent of sort of like that energy that I embody. Um, and a lot of it comes from growing up and going to Mexico. Everything's very colorful. The culture is a very rich culture. And so I want to lean into that. Um, yeah, so this show is about creating a space where we can bloom. Um, and my work, in a sense, is blooming as well. So yeah, I'm really excited that you all are here and can experience this. Y también hablo español, so si tienen preguntas, también me pueden preguntar en español, and we can have a dialogue that way too. Um, yeah, but I think the, I always wanted, or recently in my own practice, I've been really leaning into terracotta as my body of work. Um, and this clay is really symbolic to me because my hometown in Mexico, uh, there's natural clay deposits, and it's this varro rojo. Um, and through undergrad, I sort of realized that in academia and within the clay community, there are these like hierarchies where porcelain and stoneware is seen as something higher than terracotta. And so one of my goals with this show and with choosing to be intentional about the materials I work with is elevating the red clay. I think there's like, you know, Techno like terracotta technologies and legacies. People have been working with this material for so long. So 
yeah, I want to elevate it because I think it deserves to take up that space and it deserves to be validated in that way. Yeah. Yeah, so um, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning as well is we will be having a Q&A session at the end. So, cualquier preguntas que tienen, any questions you do have, we will be taking them at the end. Um, so, yeah, I think just to get started about sort of the content, I remember when we first started talking about this show, you were exploring sort of the conceptual background of Xochitlalpan, which is a Nahuatl word for the floral paradise. It was a realm in which the ancestors dwelled, but in the um, Mexica or Aztec tradition of in Xochitl in Cuicatl, also known as flower and song, it was a realm that could be called down through the performative arts into a plane where we are sharing it in the mortal land. So it's not the same as the religious visions of divinity that the colonizers brought over from Spain, where heaven is a separate realm. It really had an interconnectivity with where we live in the moment here on Earth. And I felt that was a really powerful tie to the way that you're doing your work, not only you know physically with process, but the way that you want community to really bloom and blossom. I love that you use that phrase. Um, but I think what's interesting too is that, you know, in addition to wanting to create the space that kind of elevates us from the norm but keeps us on the earth, you really want to do, to really focus on that sense of grasping that ability to call down this realm, to call down that energy. And I think a vessel that really is a great introduction to that is one right behind us. Um, on which you inscribed a poem of, um, that you had found uh, through your research. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more about the background of that poem and what's more or less written on the piece. Yeah, so with my practice, I, um, I have a lot of sketchbooks. And this was a poem that I randomly, every now and then I go through my sketchbooks and I'll find an idea that I'm really drawn to. Um, and so there was a poem that was inscribed from probably undergrad and it just it's always resonated with me um, and I've made text work before and I would carve my own poetry or sometimes lyrics um, and this poem is about blooming how um, it's based on us if we want to bloom or if we don't if we choose not to grow we're also choosing that path um, but yeah I wanted to be intentional about infusing a work that at least represents this moment um, and so that was this piece and this technique is very time intensive and it's very um, hard for my hands so that's why there's only one text piece and yeah I don't do it often but yeah also the idea of clay uh, it sort of immortalizes these words this moment the narrative because ceramics, in a sense, especially if it's purely decorative, not really functional, it's probably going to live forever until the sun consumes the earth, if that ever happens. But so I also like the idea of like immortalizing my own visual language and taking up that space and being intentional about the words that I carve onto my pieces. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting conversation that you're having with the material of Barro Rojo or terracotta, which um, I think in a lot of people's experience is sort of encountered in marketplaces as tourist wear or in the context of a museum where they're encountering, you know, um, pre-colonial cultures and the work that they did. And I think your deliberate choice to not only embrace it, but to take motifs and techniques and really bring them into a contemporary vernacular that you're creating is very powerful. And I think, you know, you have um, regional connections as well as the connection of being tied to Mexico in general with that strong history uh, of pre-colonial craftsmanship. But I was hoping you'd talk a little bit more about some of the specific ties that really pushed you into that moment where you were ready to embrace terracotta or barro rojo and really embrace your style and your voice. Yeah. Um, because I think it's a really unique and, and valuable one that really it's important to see because it's so often seen in these other commercialized contexts and you're taking it in a really different direction that's really valuable. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean the the warmth and the 
the color of the terracotta has always been very nostalgic for me. And it took me all five years of undergrad to realize that I wanted to be more intentional with the materials that I worked with. Um, but yeah, in undergrad, there was, the studio worked with stoneware. So it was sort of, there was a lot of obstacles in the way of accessing this material. And um, the person who I was taught by was sort of pushing the Japanese aesthetic onto us. And it never really resonated with me. And I, yeah, it took like four years of failures and things not coming out the way I envisioned them to. And that's when I really decided to shift materials. And, you know, I had to buy my own clay and then I had to figure out a palette to work with because most underglazes or the pigment that you see on the clay, most are formulated for white clay bodies. So even with working the, with the material, I've, I've had to find my own colors and mix my own recipes. But I mean, whenever I'm throwing, all these, all these pieces are made on the wheel, they're wheel thrown. I feel like something clicked. And as soon as I touched, I made like the connection with the clay and like water. I knew this was the material for me. And I love the way it stains everything. I love the way it stains my hands. Yeah, I think, and I think, yeah, I don't know, it's, it was a, it was an intuitive connection, but I did, there was a lot of resistance, and so leaning into that definitely took some reflecting and even unlearning, um, yeah, and then for my thesis show, I was intentional about working with terracotta, and after that, I've jumped back and forth because, like I said, there are these hierarchies in place. And so I'll go into certain spaces where they only do high fire. So there's not really an option to work with the low fire clay. And then, yeah, I noticed that within the ceramics community, a lot of people who do work with the red clay tend to dip it in white slip. And so I wanted to be intentional about the medium coming through. And I think that's why I work the technique that I do is graffito, so I, I draw on the surface and then I carve away. And I'm really intentional about the mark makings that I do. And yeah, it's like a connection with the piece and, and, the, and the red clay. And I wish y'all could touch the pieces. I want to have a show one day where you're invited to touch them. But yeah. So I think mark making is a really good segue into the piece that's kind of right next to us here, which is um, a diptych of your printmaking. Um, I think your mark making, uh, the relationship between the scraffito work you do on your vessels and the way that you um, approach lino cut block printing on these large scale pieces of paper, it's very interesting. Um, and I remember from our conversation, you know, you talked about how you would develop these motifs both through research and also through meditative drawing and so how they're both tied to and um, and then developed by you if from a historical perspective and bringing it in through your personal lens and into the moment and I think the the way that you were talking about intuitive you know letting your gut guide you in the process um, also was a part of how you've become you've you've come up with a technique that you use to make these prints so I thought um, you know, we might talk a little bit about your printmaking process and your design and development process to give people a sense of how that does tie into mm -hmm. the ceramic work you do. Yeah. I mean, this show was really a dream come true because I've always wanted to have that interplay between the different mediums. And so, yeah, I started doing relief also in undergrad and I just found a connection between the process of scraffito where you're carving and then also carving into the linoleum. It is rougher on your hands, so I've had to be mindful of that. Uh, but yeah, I think the connection to both, it just translated very easily. And then I print these on mulberry paper, which is a fabric-like paper. And we were intentional about not having them hinged on the bottom so that they can sort of breathe, they can move with the space. And, and I love how it messes with your eyes too, it, like the contrast, um, it's definitely intentional. Um, but yeah, so I print motifs that you can find on my own pottery. So it's sort of that interplay and when I get bored with clay, I can lean into printmaking. So it's really nice to 
also work at a scale like this. It's very labor intensive. This is a single relief stamp that I carve and then I make a grid for myself and I print it over and over. Um, and I think that's something that maybe comes from being like a working class artist. Like I've grown up seeing my parents uh, like invest a lot of their physical labor into their work so I, I sort of am I embody that as well and so with my work it is very labor intensive and that I guess as a means for me to reclaim that because it's important to like reclaim the labor that you're giving either to other people or to yourself um, it becomes meditative and so a lot of these designs are sort of repetitive once I get into it and yeah, I found that this is, I feel like I'm on my path. Like this is, whenever I'm working with clay, I do sort of enter like the flow state. Um, and so all of this is infused with a lot of joy and yeah, it's definitely really meditative. And I think once you find that flow, you can sort of surrender to the process and in that surrendering, sometimes I download certain imagery and visual. And like this show, I wanted to be intentional about leaning into my own indi indigeneity. Um, that connection has been severed because of colonialism, but this is me trying to reconnect with that. And I feel like with ceramics, I've never had to try hard, like it just, it just comes from me, it feels very intuitive. And I know like my own grandfather used to work with clay as well, so there's definitely something there. Um, yeah, yeah, I was definitely, and trying to give like an homage also to my hometown and like my roots and where I come from and never forgetting that, yes. Yeah, because I remember one interesting thing that you shared with me when we were talking about this show is that Darimoto, where you're from, used to be a center for brick making. So, of course, bricks are traditionally made with terracotta, <clears throat> and it's a very labor-intensive process, or very methodical, repetitive process. Um, and I think it's really valuable in the sense that you both, <clears throat> excuse me, reclaim and redefine and define very specifically your connection with an indigeneity, as you say, that was severed by force and are really defining it for yourself in a contemporary way, but they are also defining yourself as a laborer, that art is labor. And I think that's a really important thing to remember because I think a lot of the time there is the idea that the passion that you have for the work sort of should be enough when there is a lot of really hard body breaking work at times that can be required and asked of it and that production is quite difficult and it really ties you into the working universe and that, that I think being upfront and up, like outspoken about that is you know increasingly being you know that's something that's being said by artists but I think that incorporating that into even the concept of the show and really presenting yourself in that you know I am a worker and an artist they're not separate I think that's really valuable um, can you talk a little bit about how you you know came to that and sort of where you're taking that conceptually in your work not only in the space but you know in your community efforts um, and organizing and all of that yeah I think throughout my undergrad I've I've always been a workaholic, so I've been, I don't know how many pots I've made, it's probably in the thousands by now. And so in undergrad, I was trying really hard to find my place, to find a place that would host me, that would grant me access to resources, to equipment. And I tried all five years and I was always told that there was never enough space for me. And so I feel like that was really harmful for me and then I moved here to Houston and it was sort of the same thing and so I think for that now that I find myself in the privileged position of being able to have I mean at least like a kiln and a wheel so I can keep making I do I think there's a lot of harmful gatekeeping in the community and there's a lot of like gatekeeping of resources and especially equipment. Ceramics is really expensive. The equipment is very expensive. You need space, you need electrical work. Um, and so I wanna be intentional about that. And in San Marcos, uh, I live with 
two other roommates who I also went to undergrad with, um, and we sort of manifested this space. It's like a little art house, and we're slowly getting the space ready to open it up to community because I feel like it's so important to also be intentional about holding safe spaces for other people of color. Um, and yeah, I just realized there was a lack of diversity, especially within, like, you don't, I don't know many Mexican artists that work with clay, even like Latinx. And I've always been very critical of that. I've criticized like the clay festival that happens every year because it's, it's the same artist every year and I've never seen someone that looks like me. Um, and so I've been trying to be more intentional. Obviously there's so many obstacles and barriers in the way, especially when you come from a working class background. But yeah, just little by little building out a space and opening it up for community is definitely a goal, a goal of mine. Yeah. So like this exhibition um, is that, you know, we started our conversation from a place of wanting to explore these sort of me metaphysical concepts that tied in to the content of your work historically through Xochitlalpan or the land of flowers, which you're creating an ethereal space down on the earth. And I think, you know, mentioning that the way that the prints vibrate on the eye and the way that the color suffuses the space, I think that being in here really is that experience. But <clears throat> one thing I really appreciated is that over the course of our conversation, we ended up coming to adding this um, installation here, which is an ofrenda or an altar that is very tied to the bounties of the earth, the richness of the earth. And um, there are some specific items here like corn or maize, cacao beans, um, sempasochtl or marigold flowers that have you know specific significances, but were also acquired in and around this area. So I think it's a really beautiful way to kind of think about how we can create sacred space, how we can create value and time for repose. But there are a couple of specific things that informed your decision on what to place and what to buy here. So I just wanted to, uh, you to talk a little bit, if you could, about your thinking behind this, how you set it up, and what some of the items specifically mean here in this altar. Yeah. So in Aztec mythology, the god associated with, sir, with clay, which is... Uh, clay and water is Tlatloc, so it's the god of rain. Um, and to bring offerings to him, you bring harvest. And so I, I went to all the farmers markets around here and I collected these materials. Um, and so like some of the offerings is cacao, which is like a very sacred offering to most gods. Um, and then I got maize, and maize comes in so many colors. I knew that I wanted to get different colors. Um, yeah, and I see it as an offering, and it, it, also I want to be intentional about leaning into the idea of abundance. Um, and then the pieces that are displayed as well are very intentional because the motifs themselves are also reflective of the concept and like the checkerboard pattern that I'm really into is also inspired by maize. Um, and so the pieces are also, and also this one, the also the checkered one, the form is also inspired by the gourds, which I love and like the fullness of it. So yeah, I was just trying to honor that and make those connections and also be intentional about you know, the resources that I have and who I share those with. Um, yeah. So everything was collected from either like Mexican vendors or Latinx people. And yeah, just going to the mercados was also really beautiful because you see that and you see these people thriving and they're still, you know, like harvesting crops that have been around and have been cultivated for millennia. So that was also a really wonderful experience, yeah. So <clears throat> one word that you used that really continued to come up in our conversations was abundance. And I think, you know, in addition to this ofrenda being, you know, geared towards Tlaloc and an offering, you know, and thanks to the god of water for providing 
the necessary material to make clay workable by the hand. Um, it's also, I think, a reflection of your sense of generosity and you want your work and this experience to be a gift to others so that in being here and sharing this space and this energy, you can impart the understanding that abundant, you know, that community is not a limited resource, that abundance exists, that we can create the conditions for our communities to bloom. And I think, you know, the fact that you have presented this ritual space that is an offering not only to Tlaloc, but to the community, does tie into your work with the Tepeyac Collective that um, I, through a little research of my own, I realized that is Tepeyac is Nahuatl for on top of a hill. And it's a reference to the fact that your alma mater um, in San Marcos is on top of a hill. So it's a very apropos name, and I know the collective is based out of there. Um, and I thought it'd be a great opportunity for you to share kind of what you're doing with the collective, what your intentions are, and kind of how that sort of generous spirit that you bring to your work in this installation is being enacted in the real world through the Tepeyac Collective. Yeah, more than anything, I see it as a collective, as a way of resistance in a way like um the founders were all mexican and so it's sort of like a reclamation of just just space it's taking up space um and i met both of them through undergrad so that's why we we went with the name tepeya because it it really represented like when i met them um, I feel like I was coming into myself as a person and I was finally being able to be openly Mexican. Um, and so that was really transformative for me and my work is so identity based that as soon as I started to be more myself, my work naturally started transforming. Um, but yeah, more than anything, we just want to take up space and we want to be intentional about making safe spaces and also holding space for accountability because I understand that like even within our own community there's a lot of you know like colorism and racism so we we also hold space for accountability so we can try to be try to minimize the harm um yeah but right now we're um, just organizing and focusing on collaborating and uh, elevating other people of color um, and giving them access to the little, the resources that we have and just sharing that space and really creating magic because we're all full of it and it, you just have to lean into it. Um, and I try to be in intentional with my own practice for creating space for playfulness as well and curiosity and not taking ourselves so much ser so seriously. Um, so yeah, it's just holding space. Um, if you look on our page, we say that we hold space for this madre because it's like <laughs> we we want to be playful. We want to be lean into the chaos of it all while also like rec like a reclamation of our identity and the space and the landscape. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that word desmadre. For those who are not um, familiar, it kind of means like a chaotic mess, um, but it's also a very fun and joy-filled word. So you can definitely use it in a sort of like, wow, that was like crazy kind of way. And I think um, that that humor and that joy is so important to hold on to. And I think it really brings people together because in times that are, you know, as they often are quite difficult personally or on a broader level, maintaining that connection with other people and with the ability to find humor in the desmadre, it's uh, very important. Um, which actually I think is a great segue into one of my favorite pieces, which is in the center of the space here, <coughs> where um, this large piece has not only your distinctive flower and eye motifs all across it, but you've also incorporated um, some gold luster teardrops and um, I really love the story and the concept behind that piece so I was hoping you might share that with yeah. folks right now. Yeah so I wanted to be since my work is identity based I know I always wanted to make work that honors vulnerability um, especially in our own community. I've always been a chillona which is like a crybaby so I've been 
leaning into that and the motifs honor that and the tears are gold because I think that's actually like my strength. And so that's what that piece is about. Um, and yeah, that's gold luster. So it's like real gold on the piece. And yeah, I made a whole series of it. And yeah, just honoring that. Yeah, I personally also find it very relatable. So <laughs> I definitely love the piece. Um, and let me just check where we are on time. Okay, so um, I did want to talk while we're here about the cinder blocks. Um, I think visually they're so striking and I'm so happy we were able to make that happen in the space and using, you know, tying the yellow that we've used on the walls and the pedestals into this um, sort of not less traditional display material. Um, I think it really adds something to the way that the pieces are on top of it. I think it's sort of grounding in an interesting way. Um, and so I wanted to talk about you know, I know you've used these before in uh, times when you've showed your work. Um, so I thought it might be interesting to learn more about, you know, why you were drawn to them as display objects and kind of where you've taken those experimentally throughout uh, the years. Yeah. Um, it's sort of funny because initially I leaned into cinder blocks because uh, for my thesis I made really large pieces that were so heavy that I was terrified that I was going to bust through a pedestal. Uh, so that's why I did cinder blocks and then I sort of, I really enjoy the texture of them and I like the idea of moving away from the white box aesthetic. Uh, normally galleries aren't really keen on allowing you to paint their uh, furniture. So in most spaces when I bring them that sort of grants me that freedom because I'm really into color. And so I always want to paint everything and so cinder blocks even though they're so heavy, they are pretty cheap. Um, and I like the idea of like building it. And it's just an aesthetic that I'm drawn to, but as I've been exploring the ideas more, it's really fun playing around with the configuration. And then, yeah, sometimes it becomes a installation and like a landscape on its own. And I really enjoy that, and that's definitely something I'm gonna continue to lean into moving forward. So I think, you know, in addition to the historic and conceptual place of the land of flowers, um, you're bringing the flower into your own personal visual sort of vernacular. Um, has a very contemporary tie as well. So like in addition to flowers sort of being seen by uh, Nahuatl peoples as a conduit to divinity, um, it's very common, you know, in contemporary Mexican culture to see the preponderance of flowers. So like the Virgen de Guadalupe is very uh, distinctly associated with roses. And so um, I think just diving a little more into that specific motif um, would be interesting and sort of like where you're, where you're taking your like thoughts from, where your feelings are coming from on it, and how you're personally relating to it as well as from that historical mm -hmm. standpoint. I think for me, I was drawn to the motif, thinking about flower as like this softness, the softness of like the petals, and also the blooming, because I feel like for me, working with this medium has been very healing for myself. So it gives me room to heal, to grow, to bloom, and so I kind of fell into that motif uh, sort of naturally. And I like the idea of thinking of like softness of flowers versus the hardness of the clay. Um, and then I'm trying to move into a more sculptural uh, aesthetic with my work. And so, yeah, thinking about flowers and the way some flowering plants have thorns and they're sort of like protective of these delicate beautiful blooms. So that's sort of where the petaling of the rim and the thorns also comes from. Um, and then I like the idea of my pots sort of being protective and being beautiful, but at the same time, like I could probably use one as a weapon, you know, like it can, it's sort of defensive. Um, and that's probably something like unconsciously about me and like where I'm at in my life um, but yeah and so I, I thought about the idea of like with the eyes like my pots are always watching out for me but in a sense it's also protection I see it as a symbol of protection yeah 
So I think that that touches on some interesting um, sort of facets of your work where it's got this very, um, you know, you have a visual vocabulary, there are ritual and spiritual elements to it, but of course you're also a very prolific uh, functional wear maker. Um, so I was interested in talking a little bit about the relationship between the functional wear that you make and the pieces that have more of a conceptual quality, um, you know, where the overlap is or how you approach those two different methods of making when it comes to production for mm -hmm. use in functional spaces and also for work like a lot of the pieces in the gallery here. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, anything that's sculptural or decorative, it definitely, especially pieces of this scale, take a lot more time, materials, and resources. Um, but I do like working big. I don't know if it's because I'm so small. I feel like I have to, like flex all the time but I, I also there's something about the form I'm really drawn to the fullness of it um, but yeah I think with my functional work more than anything I'm always thinking about like the ergonomics of it the functionality of it um, I think I make functional work because unfortunately you know like we live in a society that is capitalism and I have to capitalize on my labor so that's why I make uh, functional pots but if I could I would love to just coil build huge pieces and just take my time on it because I think for me it's more about my connection with the material it's about the process rather than the product um, but I'm also really grateful and incredibly privileged that people want to buy my work and collect it that's definitely a privilege um, yeah but it's you know it's all infused with the same chaotic but at the same time it's like organized energy I guess because like the way I draw it on it but I'm always listening to cumbia I'm always listening to reggaeton um, recently it's like narco corridos <laughs> really into that so it's all the work is definitely infused with energy and I, I, I'm very intentional about yeah I feel like even working sometimes it allows you to enter this different space um, and I'm intentional about what I'm bringing forward. And then, you know, all of this is handmade. So also, I feel like our hands are portals to the energy that exists within us. And I think we should all be more intentional about the things we touch, the things we create, the things we birth. Definitely. Yeah, I think that puts me in mind of, you know, some of the qualities of Barro Rojo that you talked about and sort of even the specific printmaking technique that you were drawn to, which is that, you know, terracotta is a softer clay mm -hmm. than most. So it's, you know, malleable in a way that maybe other clay bodies aren't. Um, and the same so that, you know, lino cut or linoleum prints as opposed to woodblock prints they're relatively easier and provide more control. And I think that, you know, leaning into softness and, you know, with the image of the flower and the embracing of vulnerability, um, as an act of resistance, I think that is, it's, it's a really compelling way to say, I embrace softness, I don't glorify suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, I should be able to enjoy my life and my craft as yeah. well as produce work that is compelling and beautiful. Um, and I think it's, you know, tying back to the idea of the value of labor and the value of your body in the making of the work. Um, I'm really interested in that sort of embrace of softness mm -hmm. and when it comes to materiality and process, you know, where you think you want to take it next. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely been a journey because I've been there. I mean, for my thesis in undergrad, like my work was about trauma, but I feel like I've realized that for black and brown bodies, sometimes that's really common and that's what people want to see they want to see us make trauma porn um and that's not something i want to embody because it's heavy and so and also yeah for my thesis i i did like three foot pots and i carved like poetry that had to do with my trauma and it was a lot of me unpacking um and now one of those pieces like sits in a hotel and it's like so out of context of what it originated from that I realized that I wanted to be like I don't want to sell my pain and even though this is this does provide like therapy and healing for me I want it to be about joy I want it to be about color 
I want it to be about richness. And that's what I want to lean into. And yeah, with my own practice, I've I've let go of perfectionism. Um, I'm, all my pe none of them are perfect, in my opinion. I lean into the chaos of it. Because also the material has a mind of its own. Like you can put in so much time and effort into a piece and it might crack. But also that's the nature of clay. So that's also something that it's interesting to grapple with. Because obviously if it's a functional piece and there's a huge crack on it, it takes away the function even though it could be a planter. But just leaning into that and not taking myself so seriously and whenever I connect with the medium, having curiosity or playfulness, I make a lot of drawings of ridiculous pots that seem impossible to make, but nothing is too ridiculous. I think every idea should be entertained. And I think that's been very transformative for my practice. And also leaning into gentleness and reclaiming my relationship with rest has been really important as well. Yeah. Great. All right. I'm going to take one more time check and see where we're at. Okay. Well, um, I am going to take a minute and see if we have any questions from the audience um, while we're... Oh, yep. Yeah. All right. sort of like a, a floral motif. I forget where I found it, but it was like all over my sketchbooks. And then since I was talking about the Chiyona thing, that's why it has tears. And then this is a motif that I've been drawing my whole life. There's sketchbooks I have from high school that is just, I think there's something about repetition that really draws me. And that's probably one of the main things in my practice. And so I see these as petals. That's what I call them. Um, and then the rim is reflective of that motif as well. But yeah, I don't know. I just, I love carving it, honestly. It's not even like there's no function or anything to it. I just really enjoy it. And I feel like centering joy is more important to me than maybe like aesthetic or function. But yeah, it's just motifs that have always informed my practice. I think that's interesting. Um, it just put me in mind of the way that you specifically do your printmaking as well, where it's the one block and the repetition of that process and being in that flow state kind of providing that calm and joy and you're kind of really leaning into how do I want to work? How does my body respond to this process? So that's really interesting. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, I think some of them were definitely sketched. I think a lot of them. And then I'll take one sketch and sort of play with the form. Sometimes you're working on a piece and you want it to be something, but the clay doesn't want to be that. So it ends up being something else. Um, but definitely the larger pieces take a lot more planning and a lot more calibrating. Like this one was made in a lot of sections and you can see the seam because, you know, I'm not a perfectionist. Um, but yeah, I, I've been drawing pots with like the petaled rims for a long time and it wasn't until recently that I actually challenged myself to try to achieve that. So yeah, sometimes the sketch comes first, sometimes the pot just happens and then I get obsessed with it and I just draw it over and over. And recently I've been starting to get into carving linoleum blocks of pottery. So yeah, I've been getting into that. Yeah, just an uh, opportunity for a little plug. Um, Gabo is a very prolific Instagram poster and <laughs> often posts some of her really amazing prints, which because this show is conceptually about yellow, you're really seeing her yellow prints, but she uses a really beautiful array of colors and palette. And a lot of her prints, which she features on her Instagram at Gabo Martini Pots with two T's, um, feature images of her pottery, which I really love that translation of the 3D to the 2D and it's definitely a circular conversation back and forth. Any other questions? Yes. I have one on just 
the kind of interior and the choice of red and how you see that interplaying with the yellow and why, why red and inside? Yeah, more than anything, uh, there's a very limited uh, amount of glazes that I can use for the red ter or for the terracotta. It's hard to find colors that fire the right way, so the orange and the red, just functional, functionally speaking, um, are some of the easier colors. But I'm also really drawn to like vibrance and the contrast. And so I like the idea of the outside being really busy and then you look inside and it's this like really bright color. So I'm really into that. I think for this show, I was definitely leaning into warm colors. Yes. Is your client sourced from a specific place? Um, I buy commercially prepared clay from Armadillo Clay, which is a Texas-based company. Um, but I'm not sure where the red art, which is the, what makes the clay red, I'm not sure where the source from. I feel like they probably mine it from New Mexico or somewhere over there, maybe Arizona. Yeah. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about these motifs here that are around the necks of several of your pots? They look to me like horns or thorns. Or are those mm -hmm. flower thorns? Yeah, I, I think I see them as thorns. Um, I think that's something that I drew for a while and then never did it until I did. Mm -hmm. And I just appreciate the way it plays with light and I feel like it, it serves as a contrast to the overall fullness and sort of softness of the piece itself. Um, I used to make pieces that were like covered in it and then one of them fell on me and almost killed me. So I was like, okay, maybe I need to minimalize a little bit. And now it's sort of just like an adornment. Yeah. Yeah, that was at the Glacelle. It was really embarrassing. Um, I actually wanted to ask a little bit about the thorns and the petal tops. Um, I would like to know a little bit about the, the process of developing them, you know, what were some setbacks, what were some challenges you found, and, you know, the journey of developing these techniques where you've gotten them that are in, a, in such a way that they're both so clearly handmade and also so uniform in their way, where you're kind of harnessing the best of both. Yeah, they're definitely not perfect because it's really challenging to cut the clay in that way. Um, and when I first started doing it, um, everywhere where I would make an incision, which is where the petal comes down, I would always get cracks. So I invested like three months of making these massive pieces and all of them cracked. Um, so it's definitely, you have to do it when the clay is just the right consistency. Um, and then I always cut the rim first, and then based on the rim, I follow that with the thorns. So it, the thorns either, either happen like in the middle of the petal. Well, this one's kind of off, but this one is like lined up. And I feel like numerology is big in my work for some reason, like the number eight, but I don't really fully understand that yet. I haven't like digged into that. Um, but yeah, I just break up the piece visually and then do what, and then you can see that even the, the carvings also sort of follow the line that was placed from the very top. And then it just fits the form and shifts with the fullness of the form. Yeah, I really love the, yeah, like I said, the, the tension between the uniformity and the very clear mark of the hand. Um, again, it kind of makes me think a lot about how you are, you know, in this place where you're very proud to say art is work, I am a worker, and that, you know, you don't want to hide that, and that if anything, that those kind of quote-unquote inconsistencies add to the work in a huge way. Um, that adds that humanity and that sort of groundedness that I think really makes it so powerful. So, any other questions? Anyone? All right, well, I was going to continue on with, I think, a little bit of sort of projecting. Um, you know, I've really, I've been very happy and I've really enjoyed working with you and presenting your work in the context of, you know, this exhibition space where we were able to do some interpretive work and unpacking some ideas that, you know, you had been thinking on and 
really working on developing. Um, so I wanted to know maybe what you would, what you're thinking of next. Like, what's coming up next? What do you have in mind? Yeah, I think definitely I'm gonna keep playing around with cinder block installations, and it's really interesting. But whenever I have like a show coming up, the color always comes first. It's not what type of work or motifs or materials, it's the color. And so it's a dream come true to finally do an all yellow show. And it was amazing how well, like, like I was scared all the yellows were gonna be off, but I feel like this looks really good. But yeah, I wanna lean into working slower, um, more intentionally. Um, and yeah, mess around with more cinder block installations. Also, I'm really drawn, I have a really big green thumb that I inherited from my grandma. And so I've always loved the idea, cause terracotta traditionally also makes all the flower pots. So I've been thinking about how to do an installation with live plants in it. I think that would be cool as well. Yeah, uh, we had discussed it, but because we're a little bit of a porous old building, we weren't sure how safe uh, the work in both galleries would be with the addition of live plants, but it was really enjoyable to get to collaborate um, on what kind of items would be included in the ofrenda. Um, and I think, um, you know, yeah, I just am really pleased with how it turned out. I'm very happy you're happy. Um, and I think overall, <clears throat> some of the themes that you wanted to bring out and really touch on were very salient to me and I am really happy that, you know, we had the opportunity to connect and explore those more in depth. Um, and I'm just, yeah, so we've just got about like nine more minutes so we can do a little soft shoe, we can take more questions, like feel free, don't be shy, any questions y'all have, yeah, go for it. When you started kind of gravitating toward the material, did you have any yeah, like I said, most pigments, most paints are formulated for white clay bodies, so there was a lot of troubleshooting. And at the time, I was doing a lot of gas firing, which is in a gas kiln. And that firing is really intense because it brings up a lot of the like oxides in the clay, so my pieces would come out milky or cloudy. And that's not what I was going for at all, but I just pushed through and eventually I landed on the color palette that I want to explore, but it definitely took a long, and even now, I mean, I'm always recalibrating and finding new colors that work for me, for sure. Also, like, like when you go to Mexico, you see these crazy sculptures that are made from this clay, and there's like, there's that kind of gravity it carries, and then it's like you said, it's made, it's used to make the cheapest pots you can get it. So just like, you know, kind of weighing those two things, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, my family makes fun of me because every time we go to Mexico, I just blow my budget on like yeah. artesanías. But I think we have to be intentional about that. And, you know, I try not to directly appropriate any of like the folk art. This is kind of like my own thing. Um, but I'm still trying to honor and make space for it and elevate it at the same time. And especially with Mexican handiwork, you know, like, um, yeah, you say you're a Mexican artist and they expect you to make it for cheap, but it really shouldn't be that way. And just because it's so functional, that shouldn't take away from the value of it. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I've been reflecting on sort of the classification that's given of like artists and artesana. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that tension. Yeah, and I guess that's like that conversation of like fine art versus craft. And I mean, that was uh, madre. when I was like an undergrad, that's definitely like a big conversation to have. And within that conversation, like materials get categorized as either or. And so, yeah, I mean, I want to be intentional about me myself unlearning that and also like pushing against it because... Yeah, like I went to college and I was taught how to make pots for a wood kiln or a gas kiln when in reality like this material and like the technology that existed then exists now and yet the canon like is really focused on like a, a specific 
medium. And yeah, so I've had to be very intentional about unlearning that. And even like unlearning some of the things that were taught of like the value of things, for sure, yeah. I think it definitely needs to be like elevated, for sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wonder if you could talk about the technique of scraffito and like kind of what it means for you and like just really resonated like you're so connected to the material but you're also kind of carving away at it and revealing using it yeah. to reveal other things so yeah it'd just be really interesting. Yeah I mean I definitely have to be really present when I'm doing it. Um, I mean I could mess up but then you have to like either it's a reductive process so there's not a lot of room for error, but basically what I do, and you can kind of see where the tooling marks are, when the piece is spinning out, paint the whole thing yellow. It's like bands of yellow. And then I use a gel food coloring. I water it down like watercolor, and I make myself guides. And then I just follow that. But I don't directly like make a guide of the flower. I just square it off. And so I have an idea of how to break up the space and then I just go for it. It sort of, it happens in like a time vacuum because I forget how intensive it is because I just get so into it. And then it's often my body that reminds me to take breaks and lean away from it. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question because I remember when Gabo shared for the first time that uh, gel food, food coloring technique mm -hmm. for the poem vessel over there, I was like, wow, I just, it's so, yeah, yeah I really appreciated the sort of, uh, Utility, you know, using those you know kitchen ingredients and then really blocking it out and still hand lettering on that one. I know is very labor intensive. Yeah. And I guess that's also me trying to lean into the idea of rasquache, which is like making do with what you have. Um, yeah, I think I've always been like a, a problem solver, <laughs> and I have all these dreams, and I'm gonna make them happen no matter what. So. It's like having, developing a different relationship with materials and seeing things for their functionality and like stretching it. Yeah, I do that. Do we have any other questions from the audience? All right, let me just check my celular. All right, well, um, I think with just four minutes to go, um, I'll just go ahead and sort of say we've covered a lot of ground. I think, is there anything before we sort of round things out that you want to share with the audience that you want to say that you want folks to take away with them after being in this space and experiencing the work with the vision that you really wanted to impart in our work together and bringing it to the Craft Center? Um, I just hope y'all can walk away feeling the joy that I tried to instill in all this work and like the energy and yeah hopefully we can move forward with greater intention when we're in spaces like this and yeah within community yeah well with that I'm going to thank everybody who came today thank you so much really appreciate all your insightful questions and your input and of course, thank you again, Gabo. It was such an honor to work with you, and I'm so glad that we were able to bring your wonderful work here to the Craft Center. So enjoy checking out the space further. We'll be hanging out for a little bit if you have any other last minute questions. Um, and make sure you follow Gabo on Instagram where she's very active because she's doing amazing work, and we really are excited to see where she goes next. Thank, thank you, you, Gabo. Thank you, guys.